title of my talk today is Can Biologically Sensitive Stress Research Be Used to Optimize Educational Environments? Uh, it's got a question mark at the end of it because we're really in the beginning of a new body of research here and integrating biological markers of stress uh, into educational settings to try to understand if these can be used to help children perform better and also have uh, better health outcomes over the long term. Um, so we'll start with an overview of not all stress is bad. We'll talk about the different types of stress. We'll talk about individual uh, differences and biological sensitivity to context and the dan dandelion and orchid theory of individual differences. We'll talk about the stress response system and how stress becomes biologically embedded. We will talk about the effects of stress on learning and memory and health. Uh, we'll talk about the schools, schools really as biologically sensitive systems, um, which is very important. The systems research is uh, showing remarkable um, data in terms of how things all work together and thinking about a school as really a system and a biological system is key. So we'll talk about that. And the goal is really to, to harness this biological data in a manner that can help optimize educational outcomes and learning environments for children and particularly uh, children living in poverty. So a, a quick uh, nutshell on stress. Uh, it's par partly nature and partly nurture. Um, as, as the definition of stress is a state of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or very demanding circumstances. So again, there's that ne negative connotation of stress. Um, twin studies show that there are sizable individual differences in the response and reactivity to stress. Uh, the heritability is anywhere between 30 and 50 percent, depending on which study you're looking at. So genetics play a significant role. Nurture is incredibly important, too. It's very important with this, with this line of, in this field of behavioral genetics. It's the human nature to ask how much is nature and how much is nurture, but it really is an integrated um, relationship throughout the course of the lifespan. So it's really nature and nurture working together. But there are genes that can confer vulnerability to stress, like the 5-HTT serotonin transporter gene, um, the oxytocin receptor gene, and the DRD4, 7-repeat allele. We can talk about any of this in, in detail. Uh, later, I can provide additional information, but there are, there are genes associated with the stress response. Generally, effect sizes are very, very small. However, it's important to, to remember that over a lifespan, a small effect size in the beginning can amount to a larger effect size later on in life. So stress perception and reactivity are mediated by genes, environmental context, and then the gene-environment interactions, this whole field of epigenetics. And there is also uh, evidence on the intergenerational transmission of stress. So it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating and exploding field, really, as we're understanding the implications. So bottom line, stress is really in the eye of the beholder. So per, what was perceived by an individual is really the biologic, biological reality of what is happening. Uh, again, not all stress is bad. The, uh, over 100 years ago, Yerkes and Dotson created the Yerkes Dotson Law, and there is an inverse U-shaped curve of stress and performance. So uh, both low stress and high stress are not good. And there tends to be this, this sort of bell-shaped curve in the middle of performance. And, and people need a certain amount of stress to be able to perform at their optimal level. And this depends on the individual. It depends on the context. But there is a, it's a proper level of good stress for each person. So d going into types of stress, the, there are three primary types of stress. And, and a lot of this was conceptualized by Jack Shonkoff and his group at Harvard. Um, who's done tremendous work in this arena. There is positive stress. This is this motivating force of stress on, on, on performance and, and uh, uh, using stress as a, as a positive force. Tolerable stress, which is st when stressful external events occur in a child's life but are manageable with uh, nurturing adult support, buffering adult support to really buffer the effects of the stressor and help the child feel safe. So those are tolerable stress, that's tolerable stress. Toxic stress is extraneous shocks to the system environmentally, and this can be uh, abuse, adverse childhood experiences, economic insecurity stemming from poverty uh, that are experienced by the child in the absence of buffering adult support. Uh, that, that is when the, the biological mediators of stress can have longer term implications that are critical in terms of learning, memory, and health outcomes. So moving on to biological sensitivity to context, all of these various stressors, these categories, will be per perceived by an individual child in a, 
in a unique manner depending on who they are, their genetics, their life experience, and then how these, how these all work together in their support system around them. But, but inherently, there, there, there is a range, as there are in all human behaviors, of, of response and reactivity to stress. And there, on one end of the spectrum, the dandelion, children who can, as you see from the picture here, grow in a crack in a rock. You know, they're just, they're very resilient. They can bounce back. They, they're, they're hardy. Uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, more orchid types of children who, who need perfect environmental conditions to really thrive. And so um, thinking about this range is, is essential in understanding these individual uh, differences in both susceptibility and, and resilience to environmental conditions. So moving into the stress response system and how these individual differences are mediated at, at a biological level, the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, uh, is one of the, the primary systems involved in the stress response. And, and the HPA axis is responsible for emitting cortisol, which is the, which is the hormone most uh, associated and most studied as related to stress. And we'll talk about cortisol a little bit later as we discuss uh, our, our topic today. The autonomic nervous system is also a uh, system, this is a, the automatic um, uh, respiration, you know, breathing, cardiovascular function, the automatic nervous system is also highly involved in the stress response. Um, alpha amylase is a key marker of autono uh, autonomic nervous system function and you see cortisol and amylase both measure the stress response but in different ways. Uh, we have inflammatory markers that are released during the stress response, such as cytokines like IL-6 and IL-8. Um, these can be measured through blood, through saliva, um, through various, various different uh, uh, manners. Um, and then C-reactive protein is, is also an uh, inflammatory marker that's highly studied as in response to you know, stress and the stress response system. Nerve growth factor is a newer um, uh, analyte that's being studied uh, in terms of the stress response system, and it's more of a resilience uh, factor in sort of um, uh, uh, mediating the effects of cortisol. So what we're understanding now is we're getting deeper into the stress response system from a biological standpoint, as we get these, this uh, coordinated system of different biological markers working together to mediate individual differences in the stress response. These are all important because they affect memory and learning. So in this uh, slide we have a, a, a picture of the brain and in fMRI studies what we know is that uh, elevated levels of cortisol over the long term, particularly under conditions of chronic stress, can reshape the functionality of brain structures. So the hippocampus, which is the primary brain structure involved in learning and memory, uh, what we've seen in fMRI studies is it actually shrinks, it becomes smaller, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a muscle that, that shrinks. Um, and so there are <clears throat> performance uh, implications from that as well, clearly. Uh, the prefrontal cortex, the brain structure most highly involved in executive function skills and mediating um, uh, task performance and regulation and so forth. Uh, we see uh, imp implications for the prefrontal cortex as well, and when, that, when the prefrontal cortex is affected, it can't properly regulate the amygdala, which is the brain structure really involved in emotional reactivity and emotional response. And so what we see in fMRI studies is an enlarged amygdala size. So we get the hippocampus, you know, not working properly to integrate the learning and memory. And then we have the amygdala and, and an overreactive response to stress, this pattern of the stress response that becomes elevated as these, these connections, these neural connections are really overwired. In terms of health, um, which is one topic we don't talk about as much in, in the educational space, but it's critical because the, the foundations of health, as we're learning more and more about health and the roots of health, we're really looking to childhood and even prenatally. Um, to really understand uh, the foundations of health over the long, over the life term. The biological embedding of chronic stress is uh, a research arena that's been, uh, it's been uh, going on for decades, but really it's, it's become quite, um, there's been a great deal of interest more recently around this metric of allostatic load. And in Paul Tuff's book, How Children Succeed, which is a fabulous book, it brought this notion of allostatic load or the biological embedding of stress into the educational 
discussion. And essentially, allostatic load is uh, a concept that, that gets to the core of how the mind and the body are linked. We know that there's a link between the mind and the body and how we, how we perceive stress in the world around us and how it's related to uh, you know, illness and, and, and so forth. Um, allostatic load gets to why this happens, really the underlying mechanisms. The body is designed to deal with stress. We have stress in our lives, all of us do, at different levels. And our body is designed to react and revert to homeostasis to get back to, to baseline. This doesn't always happen, and under conditions of chronic stress, you get these dis entirely dysregulated systems of stress hormones reshaping brain function and, and, and health outcomes over the long term. So with, with uh, the biological embedding of stress and allostatic load, we're also seeing much higher rates of chronic disease over the long, over the long term. So it's important to bear that in mind. Uh, the physiological toll of, of chronic stress um, and this, this notion of allostatic load pulls in the HPA axis, as we were talking about, which is part of the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight nervous system, the, the autonomic nervous system, um, the inflammatory system, cardiovascular uh, system, and the metabolic system, and then the respiratory system. And it really pulls in markers from all of these systems to, uh, to, uh, to understand how, how high a person's risk is based on what their numbers look like in these various systems. And one system interacts with another system. So you really got to, got to think about it as a cascade effect. You've got high levels of cortisol affecting another thing affecting another thing, and it, it takes its toll. You also get uh, uh, behavioral issues of dealing with chronic stress that uh, manifest in you know, not getting enough sleep and uh, not eating proper food and those kinds of things, and that can really exacerbate the whole process and link with, it helps explain the link with chronic disease over the longer term. Uh, really wanted to, stress is, is endemic in all of our lives in some way, shape, or form, as I've said. And while I've mentioned poverty several times in this conversation, it's important to understand that stress cuts across socioeconomic lines. So there are, there's the chronic stress of, of, of poverty, poverty and those implications. There is also stress in, in, uh, in, in very high pressure academic environments. And again, on, in the dandelion orchid conversation, depending on the child, uh, that stress is going to be manifested in, in different ways. Um, so really, uh, what I want to really uh, convey or really convey with this point is that it, uh, it's important across the board, not just in terms of poverty, although that is where there is a tremendous need and where a great deal of resources need to be focused at this time, but it does cut across socioeconomic lines and it's important for everybody. Moving on to uh, systems, and we've talked a lot about individual differences now, but let's talk a bit about schools and schools as biological systems. Um, we can apply this sort of notion of systems biology really to school systems as well, not school systems in terms of multiple schools, but thinking about the school as a biological system as we have had uh, biologically sensitive research come out on social networks we can really observe underlying dynamics of relationships between people and you know, leadership status and popularity um, and anxiety and how these all, in, how these all operate within a, within a system, in a, in a classroom and within a, within a school. So these are important questions to be following up on and, and asking because there is, there is you know, a fair amount of documentation on the, on the uh, contagion effect of stress and stress can be contagious within groups and within systems and to the degree that we can understand this dynamic from a, from a multi-level standpoint, it may be helpful in, in helping us optimize educational environments. So and we can think about this at the classroom level and also at the school level. And I think about the healthy schools movement and you know, nutrition and exercise and how important all these things are. And I think stress management is also a, a key aspect of this, of what a really healthy school is and understanding stress and, and ameliorating that in the proper way for children. So in terms of managing stress, we all know the basics, right? It's nutrition, exercise. Um, there's a wonderful book by John Rady out called Spark, and it's on the neurobiology of, of exercise. It's good for health, behavior, attention. Um, it oxygenates the brain cells. 
um, spurs neurogenesis, it's all good. So that's very helpful and this is particularly important as this playground a recess time is being cut back on in many schools. It is important for children to get out and move. Critical. Social support is very important for stress as is sleep. There's a lot of research on sleep coming out showing how important that is in terms of healing the body and the mind at night. Can stress be an ally? So back to the positive reframing of stress. Again, perception drives reality. Um, there are ways to inoculate uh, children and, and, and adults too um, against stress. Uh, and we can think more about how, how to, uh, how to uh, uh, develop those types of interventions when we understand more about individual differences and how the biology of classrooms and schools uh, work. Um, I think about this in, in both uh, high poverty settings in terms of helping children manage their own behavior or uh, uh, under, uh, manage uh, a situation that becomes complicated by you know, finding a way to center themselves. There has been uh, some new uh, cutting edge research on, on mindfulness meditation and what it does to children's cortisol levels and their ability to pay attention and learn in the classroom. So these are just tools that are tools that we can own that are available to us in the moment, but teaching children skills where they can manage themselves um, under stressful conditions is, a, is a, I think, a, a wise and important um, intervention course to consider as we move forward. Um, there's also stress inoculation in terms of working with, with high pressure, high performance children in, uh, with test anxiety and understanding those dynamics so that we can better help them perform, but also uh, I really think about the long-term health implications of holding all of this stress. Um, so health is a key outcome as well that we're <clears throat> very interested in. So reappraising anxiety's excitement is one possibility. Thinking about stress is, okay, there's my, my heart is pounding. Okay, it's time to really kick into high gear. So kind of reshaping thoughts about what stress is and, and, and empowering children with tools to manage that stress. We looked at the, we saw the, the yerkes dotson curve earlier on. Uh, Another way to look at it, and one method that we're very interested in, is looking at a three-way model where we have the performance and we have the, the uh, cognitive anxiety, so the cognitive and the performance, just like your thoughts, and, but then modeling in the physiological as well to try to understand at what point um, the, the choke response sets in, to try to understand you know, at what point the behavior really shifts from being you know, perfectly fine and on a good trajectory to in, an, an, in a negative trajectory. So trying to understand these, these underlying dynamics by way of understanding the underlying biology uh, in, in the context of the situation. So in, in conclusion, uh, not all stress is bad. We talked about the types of stress. We talked about uh, orchids and dandelion children. And we talked about the stress response system and its biological embedding. Uh, the effects on learning, memory, and health, and schools as biologically sensitive systems. And the ultimate goal, and, and, and hopefully we will have a, a new crop of researchers who will uh, look to explore uh, educational research through a different prism in the future, integrating in uh, non-invasive uh, measures of uh, biology to really understand in a way that we've never been able to understand before individual differences in performance, how systems operate, and really harness this data in order to optimize outcomes for all children. Um, thank you very much.